That word of the Lord which forms a portion for our sermon text this morning it comes to us from Genesis chapter 25, starting at verse 7. The total days and years of Abraham's life were 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man who lived a full life, and he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zoar the Hittite, which is near Mamre. This was the field that Abraham had purchased from the descendants of Heth. Abraham was buried there with Sarah, his wife. This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Mercy, grace, and peace are yours from your God and Father and from your Savior from sin, Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. What do you consider to be old? Perhaps there is a certain sliding scale with that dependent on how old you are. They say that 40 is over the hill. Is 50 old? 60? 70? Surely 80, right? I'm not trying to anger the congregation. But there's actually biblical evidence for this fact. Moses, a man who himself lived to be 120 years old, wrote in Psalm 90, The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. As of 2018, The life expectancy in the United States is somewhere around 78.5 years. Of course, some people die at a very young age. Some people well outlive a typical lifespan. In fact, a couple weeks ago, the Guinness World Record for oldest man living was set by one Emilio Marquez. He is 112 years old and will turn 113 in August. Yet, From the Bible, we know that people used to live a lot longer. Before the flood, the man, Methuselah, lived to the ripe old age of 960. That's just 40 years shy of 1,000. God had determined it was not good for man to live this long, and he shortened that lifespan down. Today, we're pretty blessed to see 80. But Abraham was not even, quote, over the hill on his 80th birthday. He lived to be 175. Why? Why did he have such a long life? Well, God had promised him as much. But of course, in the end, he still died. That's what we do. We die. You could be blessed with a very long life, but we're all going to die unless our Savior returns first. We can take away a few things from the death of Abraham here. It's always good to be reminded that the things in this world pass away and that we and that you are no exception to that fact. But for the believer, death is not the end. It's not a period. It's an ellipsis. There's always something still coming. Today, we will have a eulogy of the victorious. It mentions the memorable. It provides closure, but it is never the end. And so we pray, Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Do you know the difference between a eulogy and an obituary? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you do if you've had to produce these things for a loved one. An obituary is a brief biography of the person. It gets published in the paper and online and announces the funeral service. A eulogy, however, is a little bit different. It's a speech that is given at the funeral, and it praises and honors their memory. The word eulogy actually means in Greek, high praise. 
Today, what we have before us in our text is more of an obituary than it really is a eulogy. The total days and years of Abraham's life were 175 years. This is merely a short, simple summary of Abraham's life, how many years he lived. It announces his death. One could, however, write an incredibly long eulogy for Abraham. He is basically the human narrative in the book of Genesis. He's the main figure from chapters 12 to 25. But we have been, because rather we have been given so much about Abraham by the Holy Spirit, we could write a really long eulogy about him, the things he did, the words he said, and we never even knew him. At the same time, this brief obituary says a lot with just a few simple words. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man who lived a full life. He was gathered to his people. When Abraham died, the Bible considered his age to be a good old age. We tend to think about age as bad. Age can be a sensitive topic because it reminds us how far removed we are from our own perceived prime. It's also sensitive because it can remind us how far away we are, or how close we are rather, at least statistically, to death. But a long life, that's nothing to scoff at or despise. As the insurance slogan goes, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. This verse is more than just listing a number of years of Abraham. It's another example of the Lord keeping his word. In our sermon text from about four weeks ago, God promised Abraham in Genesis 15, Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. It's exactly what happened here in this text. Abraham was 75 years old when God first called him and told him to leave his homeland. He was 175 years when God called him to his final home. He spent 100 years walking with the promises of his Lord. He saw those promises fulfilled and then some. The fact that Abraham lived such a long life It's worth mentioning, of course, but that's not the only thing in his paragraph. Obituaries, they're still printed. You can read them in the paper. They're quite interesting reads. You can read the life stories of people that you have never met before. But they're also unique because of what they do not say. They often are a list of the highlights in one's life, the things they did, the places they lived, the people they interacted with. But what they don't mention are the low life's lights in people's lives. Abraham was a man. He was a sinful human who trusted in his Lord. Abraham did some incredible things, and the Bible lists them. He also did some sinful things, which are also listed in the Bible. Our text is only a brief obituary and it's hardly a eulogy, but the book of Hebrews does have a pretty good eulogy for Abraham. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham, like all of us here today, in his life saw a lot of sin and grace. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that's the real eulogy. So often funerals miss that important point. Yes, when people die, it's easy to say nice things about them. Some see it to be distasteful to mention bad things about them. After all, the saying goes, you don't speak ill of the dead. But 
for the believer, this is all irrelevant. When I die, I don't want people singing my praises, saying how good of a man I was, because it's not true. I am not good. I am sinful. What did Jesus say in our gospel reading this morning? No one is good but one, that is God. We are not good people. He truly is. The only reason we can even be considered to be, quote, good, is our relationship with the good shepherd. That's why when the Christian dies, it's not about them, about their lives, about what they did. It's about Christ and what he did for them. A good eulogy also provides closure. That's what funerals and victory services do. The person who died is gone. They have their closure. Yet we remain. We struggle with the loss of someone we loved. And closure is all about moving on with our lives without that loved one in it. When Abraham died, there was closure as well. Starting at verse 9, his son, sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zoar the Hittite, which is near Mamre. This was the field that Abraham had purchased from the descendants of Heth. Abraham was buried there with Sarah, his wife. No doubt, there was probably resentment and strife between these two sons of Abraham. Imagine being Ishmael, your half-brother, 14 years younger than you, is the heir. He is considered legitimate. When he was born, Ishmael and his mother Hagar were cast out. It must have been hard growing up as Ishmael. And yet these two brothers were able to come together and bury their father. Abraham was blessed with a long life, but this also meant that he had to witness his wife's death. In chapter 23, we have the account of Sarah's death. Abraham buys a cave from Zoar the Hittite to bury her in. And he paid a pretty penny for that cave, 400 shekels of silver, a just ridiculous amount. When people are grieving, seeking closure, they can be taken advantage of. Funeral homes can charge stupendous amounts of money for coffins, urns. Does the price of the box that you are buried in really matter? Some caskets can be in the $10,000 range. A person in a plywood casket is the same as a person in a mahogany and bronze one. They are both dead. When Abraham bought the cave from Zoar the Hittite, he most certainly was being taken advantage of. But he didn't squabble. He had his wife buried there. and He'd be buried with her when he died. This wasn't just highway robbery going on here. This was an act of faith by Abraham. God had promised him this very land, which he is now paying 400 shekels of silver for. He made a point to pay it also. He needed a place, a place in that promised land where his descendants would one day live. He needed it, and he had to pay for it. He was willing to pay for it because he knew That's what would happen. Even when Abraham was grieving over the death of his loved wife, he still trusted in that promise of the Lord. When a loved one of ours dies, we too struggle with grief. I don't care what your faith level is. When someone dies, it hurts. It's painful. The unintended results of sinful people living in a sinful world When a loved one dies, a lifelong spouse like Sarah, or a father like Abraham, we look for closure. We look for comfort. The fact that the loved one was a good person, that doesn't really comfort. The fact that the loved one lived a very long and full life also does not comfort. So how do we move on? 
Well, there's a detail in this text that is the key for this closure, this moving on, and you might have missed it. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man who lived a full life, and he was gathered to his people. The phrase here that Moses writes, of course, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is interesting. He was gathered to his people. This is the first time that this phrase is used in scripture, but later it's used all the time. What does that phrase mean exactly? Here is the part where I disclose, I don't know exactly what that phrase means. I have ideas, can't insist on any of them. I think when that phrase is being used, it's similar to how the deaths of kings in Israel are later described, like the death of David in 1 Kings chapter 2. It says, So David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Rested. Or it's like when Jesus says of Lazarus, who had already died, he said to his disciples, He is merely sleeping, and I go to wake him up. I think gathered to his people is in the same vein as those phrases. Quite simply put, he went to heaven. But the phrase is interesting. Notice it is spoken first. He was gathered to his people. Then it mentions the burial. It also makes me think about Abraham's spiritual significance. He was gathered to his people. That is a people who were his. Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. Those who die trusting in the Lord, they have that same faith that Abraham had, and they too, just like he was, are accounted righteous. Abraham's body lies in the cave of Machpelah, and it remains there to this very day. That cave has quite the interesting story. First it was a basilica, then it was converted into a mosque, then it was retaken during the Crusades, and then retaken again and reconverted back into a mosque, and that's what it is to this very day. Abraham and his family's bones are there, but they're not really that important. It's not really where they are. They just left a few things there. This is the point that Jesus also emphasized. Once when he was being tested by some Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection, Jesus responded to them, Concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not just dead. They are with their God and their Lord. Yes, their bodies might remain in that cave, but they won't remain there forever. Have you buried a loved one? Where are they buried? Where would you like to be buried? Again, people facing these questions can be taken advantage of. They try to upsell you on a certain choice burial plot, or might even get you to spring for a mausoleum. The fact of the matter is it does not matter. You buried a loved one, guess what? It's not their final resting place. Those who trust in the Lord are with him now. Isaiah writes, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living doesn't really matter to where you're buried because that is not your final resting place. Your final resting place is with your Lord in heaven. How do we have comfort and closure in the face of grief and death? How do we move on? Abraham was laid in a cave, but that cave pointed ahead to another one. The fact that Jesus did not remain in his tomb is the reason, the evidence, that Abraham will not remain in his. Jesus died to pay for our sins and was raised for our justification. Death could not hold him down. 
Paul writes in Romans, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. One day, those patriarchs buried at Machpelah, they'll come out of that cave. One day, the loved ones that you have buried will no longer be in the earth. They'll be in the body, and so will you. Why should old age frighten us? Why should we be ashamed of that? Because we're closer to death? Age has nothing to do with death. Sin does. The older you are, the more grace you have received from your Lord. Whenever you do die, you're not simply buried. No, you are now gathered to your people. Paul writes, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. When you age, your eyesight tends to go. Things grow dim. But as you lose, start to lose that ability to see, the sooner you are to having your real eyesight restored. Right now, Paul says, we see dimly, as in through a mirror. But when we are gathered to our people, we'll see clearly, finally. No matter how old and learned you are, right now we only know so much. But then... When we are with Jesus, then we know as we are known. People often struggle writing obituaries. Can't really blame them. They want to make sure they get it all correct, all the details right. Except for those details about all the mistakes that person made. Obituaries, eulogies, they're all about how should we remember this person. Here in our text, Abraham breathed his last. That's quite the thing to witness. I don't know if you've ever done that, the last breath of a person. It's something that is hard to forget that you might want to try to forget. We don't want to remember our loved one broken down and bedridden. We want to remember them the way that they were, how we remember them. That's the beauty of faith, isn't it? Once you've been given faith in Christ, you know death is not the end. You know that the way that you remember them, they'll be even better than that. They'll be fully restored. We have been baptized into Jesus' death. His righteousness has been given to you. Now his obituary becomes yours. His obituary isn't one at all because he rose again so too shall you. Our death is never the end for us. Your obituary will never be finished. You will see God. You will be raised from the dead. Where he is, you will be also. Never apologize for old age or even imminent death. All it means is that you are that much closer to seeing your Lord and Savior. All it means is you're that much closer to having that eyesight fully restored. All praise and thanks be to Jesus Christ, the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and you. He is the Lord of the living. Amen. Amen.